So without any further ado, let's begin with our first session. Uh, we've got Maggie Garrity and Natalie Breitmeyer, both from Timberline Knowles, standing by in Chicago um, for our first session. Before we dive in, um, before I hand it over to them, I'm just going to read a little bit about them so you can know who is um, presenting for you. So um, we have... So Maggie Garrity, she's the Director of Nutrition Services at Timberline Knowles. Um, she oversees the dietitians and diet technicians, carries a caseload of adolescents, supervises menu and meal planning stages, and develops nutrition-related protocols on campus. She also implements current nutrition recommendations, participates in community outreach, and trains dietitians. Um, prior to joining TK, Maggie was the Nutrition Manager at Revolution in Chicago. She started at Timberline Knowles as a diet technician and progressed to a registered dietitian. Maggie attended Eastern Illinois University for her undergraduate degree in dietetics and nutrition and completed her dietetic internship at Ingalls Memorial Hospital. She's a member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, Behavioral Health, DPG, and South Suburban Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, Natalie Breitmeyer is currently working as a licensed professional counselor and dance movement therapist and a yoga specialist at Timberline Knowles in Illinois. She received her MA in Counseling and Dance Movement Therapy from Columbia College Chicago and trained as a yoga teacher with Yoga View Chicago. Natalie is a faculty member at Hubbard Street Dance Chicago's Lou Conti Dance Studio where she teaches yoga and modern dance. Natalie engages with clients from a humanistic, culturally, and trauma-informed lens and incorporates somatic psychology, yoga philosophy, play therapy, and creative arts therapies into her clinical counseling work. She received her BFA in theater with an emphasis in playwriting and directing from Cornish College of the Arts in Seattle. So those are our two presenters for you and I will graciously hand it over to you to begin our first session. Thank you so much. Yep. Hi everybody, hi. Thank you for having us. We're really excited to be here. Um, we're gonna be talking about uh, a project that Natalie and I worked on together, which is the reason that we're doing this uh, presentation together. So we titled this movement of recovery. We were careful in choosing that we didn't want to call it exercise. Um, we feel like there's lots of connotations around exercise. Mm -hmm. um, so we felt like movement was more of a flowy word and more mm -hmm. of really kind of what we're going for. And that we really want uh, our residents to individualize what movement looks like for them and not have exercise dictated to them. Um, as Kristen said, I'm the Director of Nutrition Services and I oversee the dietitian team and I get to do really creative things like this, like working with peers. Um, and coming up with um, what our residents need in the moment. And I'm Natalie, um, and part of the reason for the movement word rather than the exercise word is also because movement is a natural state for human beings. It's something that we do just in simply breathing every day. So it's already a part of what we do naturally. So we just want to encourage that natural engagement rather than that forcing um, to fit something, like Maggie was saying. Um, I'm a dance movement therapist, uh, I'm a yoga specialist here at Timberline Knowles, and then I'm also a trauma specialist here. Uh, I lead both dance movement therapy and yoga groups, as well as regular verbal counseling groups and process groups with psychoeducation, especially with trauma. Um, we see a big overlap between trauma and eating disorders here. There is uh, often um, an eating disorder behavior that comes in as a result of trauma. There may be eating disorders that are in an effort that are developed in an effort to control some part of that control that was taken away. So uh, that is sort of what we're working with here. We've got our dietary team, we've got our therapy team, and then of course we have our physicians and we've got our uh, regular admissions and discharge team as well to help with everybody here. So for the presentation today, we're going to go over um, some practical ways to incorporate movement um, and how to really understand the collaboration between the dietitian and the therapist. Um, but we'll also talk to the larger group as well and the collaboration of the entire team. Um, we'll briefly go over just some of the impacts um, and improvements of movement on mental health. And we're talking of uh, minimal movement as well, not excessive mm -hmm. exercise. Um, and we'll really walk you through a four week curriculum. So hopefully things that you can either implement in practices or um, if you are uh, a loved one or someone struggling with an eating disorder, you can take on some of these with um, the care of a therapist and or a dietitian as well. Absolutely. 
And so we're going to start just by talking a little bit about the function of eating disorder behaviors, which is probably familiar material to all of you guys listening. Um, it's important for us at Timberline Mills to think about functions of behaviors so that we're not serving to further pathologize and rather we're trying to invite a strengths-based approach to the way that we're working with clients, looking at how these things formed and where they come from. Um, we see a lot of experiential avoidance of success on the slide there with eating disorders. There is uh, an intention of problem solving that tends to go inward rather than external. So maybe there's an external issue that we're working with, but that turns internal because that's a safer place to put it. It can also make it a struggle to work with because a lot of it happens internal and we don't always see it. And so it takes a lot of careful observation time and then multiple perspectives. Um, a lot of the identified behaviors that you can see on this slide too, such as restricting, binging, overeating, rigid food choices, purging, calorie counting, over-exercising, body checking, and obsessive thinking are often compensatory in nature. They often become compulsive in nature. And so we're looking at these maybe as serving a particular function. So we have a little bit more flexibility around what we can do to help them address that need. So they have a little bit more range and choice. Um, we are also trying to support uh, residents to build more self-awareness so if they can start to understand the function, they've got a little more power in their choice of what they do as well. And so that's kind of the broader scope of functions of eating disorders, and we're going to speak a little bit more to exercise in and of itself. Um, so the eating disorders that we see commonly paired with overexercise would be anorexia, bulimia, and body dysmorphia. Um, and we often see it associated with a perfectionist attitude, so the function would be being perfect or trying to be, right? But we find that there's a cycle of never enough um, and always wanting more um, and exercising despite how you're feeling physically. So maybe ignoring how you're feeling physically or almost some numbness in your body, just moving through the motions, exercising, getting through the rep, doing the next thing um, and really setting or trying to attain goals. So always reaching for something um, so kind of feeling that need of like unfulfillment mm -hmm. or searching for the next best thing. Um, and we find that residents do set these goals that are just really kind of out there um, and unattainable to just kind of like a standard human, let alone someone who's working through recovery or not nourishing their body enough. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think too that um, that pushing through mentality we see really often here. And it's a hard one to break because it feels like sometimes for residents, if they let go of that pushing through mentality, they're fearful that they just won't do anything at all. So we're also trying to encourage some of this movement towards the gray or towards the balance from these extreme attitudes or those fears that they have about going from all to nothing at all. And that's part of that unattainable goal setting too. <laughs> So some of the complications or signs that you might see um, would be that continual exercise even when sick or injured, um, avoiding of situations. So either not going out to eat or planning your day around exercise. So maybe exercising before and after work, not allowing you to engage in your meaningful life or um, things that are important to you outside of movement. Um, avoiding things in general, bringing certain food items. We see lots of, I have lots of residents come in that have worked with physical trainers mm -hmm. or um, been provided information that may, may be helpful but may not be appropriate for someone with an eating disorder, um, but feeling very rigid about the food items you have to eat, the time frame of movement, um, and really not allowing you to, again, engage in your life. Mm -hmm. um, we also see, yeah, those time frames are so crucial and kind of like documenting uh, how much movement, how much intake, um, being very rigid around that. Mm -hmm. As a result of the excessive um, exercise, um, one thing can be poor sleep leading to fatigue or insomnia. Um, so I just give the example of a resident that I had that, um, actually Natalie and I both had this resident together. Um, she counted sit-ups throughout the night, like thousands of sit-ups, didn't allow herself to sleep until she got to, I think it was like 3,000 mm -hmm. sit-ups. Um, and so you can imagine how that impacted her night and the following day. Um, and then, you know, the um, inappropriate sleep patterns then impact, impacts her hunger and homes keys the next day. So her whole cycle is off in addition to her mood, of course, and stability throughout the day. Um, so you can see how that compulsion can really get in the way of um, participating in your life. Um, obviously, we're going to see um, impacts on you know, anxiety and depression throughout the day. Um, you may not be nourishing your body enough, even though you're over-exercising. 
Um, we see muscular uh, breakdown, which is lack of nourishment. Sometimes we see clients come in with actually too much protein and their labs are off because of that. Um, again, like lots of misinformation out there regarding exercise and um, nourishment needs. Um, bone fractures or osteoporosis we see. Um, one thing that's helpful if you can get it prior to a uh, resident coming is a bone density scan to be sure of where we're at and what kind of movement is appropriate. Yes. Um, the movement that we're incorporating is very low, low at, you know, initially, so we're, we're doing okay, but it is helpful to start to have kind of a gauge of where their bone density is at. Absolutely. Yeah, and just a fun side note for yoga is improving to improve bone density, and so the inclusion of that in our programming um, is purposeful as well, that that low impact, um, longer holds on those bones, even giving that just a little bit of pressure can help to build that bone density back. Um, and to speak really quickly to the client that Maggie mentioned, um, uh, not only was the rigidity around her exercise impacting her sleep, but then the fatigue the next day fed into that cycle of perfectionism for her, and she became frustrated with herself for not functioning the way she wanted to, um, when she would notice that she felt tired or wouldn't feel like she could complete then that exercise that fed into her cycle. and so. We see these complications maybe arise as additional symptoms on top of what's already there. And so um, what may be uh, depressive symptoms that are showing up with the eating disorder, those depressive symptoms may get even stronger in response to some of the symptoms of the eating disorder, including that perfectionism and not being able to meet those expectations. So it's a pretty vicious cycle and all of this feeds right back into that loop of I'm not enough, I need to control, if I stop then I'm gonna fall apart, um, this is protective, I don't deserve a rest, all of that stuff comes in and feeds into that loop too. Absolutely. Um, we also see actually with the same client, mm -hmm. she had a stretch of amenorrhea or lack of menses. Um, they also call it the female triad, where that's one symptom of it. Um, but you know, when you're not nourishing yourself and you're over exercising, mm -hmm. um, the menses may go. And so that's one thing that uh, would be an exclusionary criteria from this group. Um, we would want your menses to be restored and regular. <laughs> Um, so what is excessive exercise? Where do we draw the line? There's so much information out there on movement and exercise, right? Misinformation, mm -hmm. should I say? Um, but it's difficult sometimes to draw the line because it's looked at as such a healthy habit. Um, so according to the DSM-5, um, information on over-exercise looks like um, behaviors occurring on average at least once a week for three months, mm -hmm. which is not very much for exercise. Um, and so that would be as a direct result of a binge in this case. Um, so when you look at it that way, once a month, a week, once a week for three months, um, I think a lot of our residents would be characterized at that. Um, and so it's just kind of a, uh, it's up to us to weed out who's appropriate for this group and most people really are. Mm -hmm. um, I also described over exercise um, from another client, a mutual client of ours that um, was in high school and um, carried around like 10 to 12 books mm -hmm. during the school days, um, refused to go to classes, but would just pace up and down the hallway. And she would tell me, you know, Maggie wanted to go to school. She's also a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to go to school in class, but she felt this compulsion. She truly couldn't stop moving. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, even in the milieu space, she was always doing the splits or trying to move in some way, um, even just to like pulse her muscles. Mm -hmm. There's always something. So that true compulsion or inability to stop. Mm -hmm. um, there's also some examples listed, um, including like not having breaks. So we always recommend it at a minimum two rest days. Um, so if you notice that, or kind of at inappropriate times, I've had residents exercise in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. or tell mom that they're doing something different when they're actually going for a run, um, or you know a, a walk throughout the entire day. I've had clients that don't have jobs that walk for 10, 12 hours a day. Um, that rigid schedule that I had mentioned earlier, um, minimizing the fear of eating, um, and really just continuing to engage in movement without any fuel to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then that belief that this is sustainable kind of comes in there too, that this is something I should be able to keep up, this is something that I can even keep up, this is something that if I don't, it says something about me if I don't. And so there's also this attitude of this even being possible, that high expectation again that can, remains unmet, because like Maggie said, this is unsustainable for a regular human being, and especially unsustainable if that human being isn't being nourished at all. Yeah, absolutely. 
and all that leads to that guilt, mm -hmm. um, anxiety, depression, yeah. you can't fulfill those needs, right. um, right. or when movement just feels like it's not enough. Yeah. And so, um, as we've mentioned, we we're noticing clients around campus uh, who may meet the criteria for overexercising, who definitely have uh, a connection between eating disorder behaviors and some pathology or pathologized attitudes around physical activity. Um, it's also just been shown that there are 50 to 80 percent of eating disorder clients that also have a skewed attitude towards physical activity. So to go unaddressed just doesn't make sense. Um, there's also been research showing that it's a big risk for relapse to not address that physical activity component. Um, once clients just charge from a facility like ours, they are moving from our boundaries and our safety constraints out into probably their life before here. And so they have access once again to all of their compensatory and compulsive behaviors that we were helping to um, keep them from engaging in while they're here, they can go right back to that if they want to. And if we don't create a way to address that while they're here, then they don't have safety planning around relapse prevention outside of here and after discharge. Um, there's also a need to break up that rigidity while they're here about how they think about physical activities so that it doesn't feel like there's no options once they leave, that they either go back to the routine that they had or nothing at all because the routine they had wasn't healthy. So we want to be able to give them options so that it doesn't feel like it's off limits. Um, it's similar, I think, to the idea that um, in uh, sort of different from substance abuse treatment where we're looking at abstinence, we have to eat. We also have to move as human beings, and so we need to find a way to be able to helpfully incorporate both of those back into life. And, um, and it just makes sense to address that as a part of our treatment here, too. Um, we also noticed that um, there were many clients who uh, Maggie and I wanted to collaborate on uh, to figure out a movement plan in addition to uh, nutritional needs to meet that movement plan or a way to, um, to help them see those two as integrated things. Uh, and because there was such a high need for that collaboration, we figured why not create a group where we can address those two things at the same time together um, and almost uh, not have to give the clients either uh, conflicting information or information at two different times and two different weeks when maybe they forgot what came before. So we have the chance to do it uh, in the same room together. Yeah, and I like to say that this group really developed pretty organically. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, Natalie, I have this client. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how to address the movement piece, mm -hmm. but I got the meal piece down. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Yeah. And then, you know, it's now just become an immersion of the two, which is so helpful um, to decrease like any staff splitting mm -hmm. and also kind of show, you know, our collaboration right. and cohesion. Right. Um, and so it's been a really interesting mm -hmm. process. And I think some of the older studies regarding um, movement and eating disorders indicate to drop it, mm -hmm. to, to not do it at all in residential or inpatient. And, you know, as we started developing this group, we saw more and more recent studies that um, not only um, encourage it, but condone it and have lots of information to back the benefits of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so um, just speaking a little bit more to the benefits of addressing physical activity at all, we've talked about some of these. Um, the same client that we were talking about, the adolescent who uh, had this compulsive need to do close to 3,000 crunches every night um, before she could allow herself to sleep or before she could allow herself to even end her day. Um, one thing that we worked with with her was talking about what is it that this physical activity of crunches does for you? And we talked about um, how it made her feel and that it offered her some control. It made her feel strong. She kind of liked this sagittal forward and back movement. It almost feels like rocking, which is a self-soothing movement as well. Um, she was also not necessarily doing this in secret because she did speak it out to us, but previously this had been done um, not around people. It's not something that she does in front of people. It's not something that um, she would necessarily uh, bring right out into the light. And so there was a little bit of a secrecy component here. And so by looking at this during a dance movement therapy group one day, um, we were able to start to bring a little flexibility into what movement might look like. And so um, I taught her yoga sequence and then Maggie was working with her about um, the not needing this compensatory movement in order to um, meet the needs that she felt like she needed to meet in terms of weight loss and strength building. Um, and by the end of her stay here, she had brought down the number of crunches she was doing from 3,000 to in the low hundreds, mm -hmm. which was a really big deal. And she started incorporating 
yoga movement into her daily routine as well. So not only were we decreasing the amount of reps that she felt she needed to do, but we were building in that flexibility of what movement might even look like. And she started to find some joy in the yoga movement in particular. She said that it felt good. She said that it felt like she was expressing herself. She said she felt like it reduced anxiety. She was able to limit some of the tremoring that was happening in her body from anxiety as well. So it really was a way for us to get at what had been a super rigid um, behavior of hers that was really tied to self-worth. Um, in addition to that uh, addressing that piece that gets really tied into self-worth, we're also looking at how to uncouple um, the, the perfectionism that gets tied into the exercise, into the physical activity, um, and also decreasing the need for that external validation that this is enough. And so um, through movement and through increasing an attention to that internal awareness, we can also increase the client's ability to self-validate, to feel as though they are doing enough, to know what enough might mean to them, to know what over and under means. Um, so we can then reduce some of that drive for thinness or um, for a particular physique as the determinant of whether something is enough. Um, we're also looking at uh, reducing shame and guilt around exercise behaviors. And so the more we can increase the flexibility around what physical activity looks like, the more maybe we can break up those shame patterns around if I don't engage in this particular kind of exercise, then I'm not good. Or if I don't engage in that particular kind of exercise, then I have something to feel guilty about. So that's a part of this too. In addition, there is the benefit of exercise allowing for a client to um, restore weight. Again, that bone density um, can be increased through the practice of physical activity. Um, it can uh, promote uh, building of muscles, which can then also help a client to feel physically strong and then potentially mentally strong as well. So even the protective um, function of eating disorder behavior can be addressed through building strength and increasing that sense of empowerment. Uh, and <laughs> I'll just keep talking here so I can take a break. Um, also to be considered in this course though, um, is that we may be moving in ways uh, that could be triggering or activating to clients. Um, there is a, a client that Maggie and I also worked with um, who had a, a real rigid set of exercises that she did. This was an adult client um, who was, uh, it was a lot about um, you know, 50 or 60 lunges is what is best, or I need to do 50 or 60 push-ups. That's what has to be done. That's the only way I'm gonna stay strong. She had a trauma history and it made sense. She was trying to build up strength in order to feel protected and in order to feel like she could then be protector for her family. So it made sense, absolutely. We talked about other ways maybe to build in that strength, but knowing that perhaps with her, we wouldn't start with lunges or push-ups because that is her exercise of choice that then triggers right away that sense of need to complete, that sense of need to get through this or it's not enough. Um, we also uh, want to talk about what exercise looks like post-discharge. We want to address um, some of the risk factors that come in right away, some of those external triggers that might be there in social media um, or in popular culture or even family culture around exercise. Um, we want to encourage language that's not rigid around physical activity um, so that clients have that while they're, when they're leaving some more flexibility around what physical activity looks like. Um, and then we also just want to look at um, what is coming up for clients as they're re-engaging in movement and talk about that as we go to. Yeah, and I think Natalie does an amazing job of kind of balancing like their history with what's showing up on the mat um, and being cautious about you know, like trauma informed mm -hmm. wording, verbiage, you know, simple things like feel heavy in your feet yes. yeah. it may not be something appropriate, yeah. you know, for our clients, um, but that's something that you would hear often in a yoga class. So being cautious about the wording, um, uh, depending on kind of what kind of residents are in the group at that time. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I just want to point out some, we're speaking a lot to anorexia, mm -hmm. so I want to point out um, some on the a different end of the spectrum of binge eating um, or, and or bulimia. Uh, so I currently have an outpatient client um, that described to me um, when she was in treatment, which was a couple of years ago, um, at a different facility, you know, she did I think yoga maybe once a week mm -hmm. and nothing else, um, and she had a history of compulsive exercise. She 
did what's called Peter Bar, which is essentially um, a movement class, um, dance movement ish. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, it was the goal was to do 100 classes in 100 days, um, which is a class every day. So, um, you know, we taught a lot through that. But so after that experience, she went to treatment, did yoga once a week, and since then has not moved. Um, and she's described to me some fear of movement. You know, how do I move appropriately? Will I go back to that? The only thing I know is that to do this class 100 times in 100 days, where's the balance? Um, so in implementing this group, we're hoping to bridge that gap a little bit more and, um, you know, decrease that, that scary transition for our residents when yeah. they move home. Um, and so, you know, thinking also of people in larger bodies, there's some misconceptions um, that they may have. I've seen this um, sometimes here, sometimes they're really comfortable moving, sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's that shame around their body image or weight or, you know, being in a group moving with people. Right. Um, they may also have the misconception that, you know, exercise has to be really high intensity, really frequent, you have to see results right away. Um, so, you know, we're trying to make all bodies feel really comfortable in these groups and mm -hmm. dispel any of those myths. And we do that with the education portion in the beginning of the group, which we'll speak to. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to speak to a resident that we both had as well, um, mm -hmm. who uh, had a really interesting history, trauma history, where um, mom was abusive, um, physically, verbally, um, then grandma would come kind of swoop up the resident, uh, saving the resident from that abuse and would always go out to eat. And that was their, that was the way that this resident felt soothed forever. Um, and as a result, developed binge eating um, and was in a larger body and was really uncomfortable in her body. And, um, you know, we worked on a movement plan of just the first uh, week, we didn't really move outside of just regular obligation. The second week, we went for a walk once for 10 minutes. Um, you know, she, she said, I have a lot of shame in walking. I feel really winded. I have asthma. I'm embarrassed that I can't do what my peers can do. So that first week, we just did a walk, a minute walk. And then the second week, we did two. And then the third week, I involved the therapist, and we did three. Um, and so by the time that she left, she was comfortable walking around campus. And it actually looked like there was an opportunity for her to clear her head. Um, but it didn't feel like an obligation. It didn't feel scary. It didn't feel like what she had thought exercise would be. Um, it instead felt like comforting and soothing to her in a different way than food was. Absolutely. And so that's what we mean by really incorporating movement in a slow and appropriate mm -hmm. way um, and you know, backing off when we have to. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's all right for residents to come to the group and lay on the mat the entire time. Um, we really need them where they're at mm -hmm. with what feels tolerable. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is an amazing study that we found. Uh, after a little bit of uh, starting to create the group, we found this great research that really aligned with exactly what we were um, developing. Mm -hmm. And so it's a systematic review by um, Brian Cook et al. And it goes over about 150 studies. Some studies are specific to anorexia, some binge eating, some just a review of over-exercise itself, um, and some on imp implementation of exercise. Um, so it's uh, a really good resource if you're looking to implement some at whatever facility or outpatient practice you're at. So first and foremost, it talks about um, having, you know, the importance of a multidisciplinary team, which we've spoken to, um, which would also include uh, some of the studies that we found indicated um, having physical therapists is incredibly helpful, um, physicians, local team, therapists, dietitian, of course. Um, and that really allows for the program to be really catered to their exercise needs um, by having that collaboration. Um, and another piece of it that's so important is that we want this group to be contingent on uh, their adherence to our eating disorder treatment plan. So you know, we want them to generally be following the guidelines of the meal plan and adhering and participating in groups. Um, so we kind of have it as like a perk of adhering. Um, this group is kind of contingent on that. And I will say that, just as a disclaimer, this group is mostly appropriate for a residential or um, hospital setting uh, where you have the monitoring staff 24-7. It could be implemented at lower levels of care, but for the purposes of this presentation, that's what we're focusing on. Um, as far as medications, we want them to obviously be safe and stable, so no dizziness or stasis or less. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully normalized lab values and EKG that's normal, um, and really just able to walk. Comfort and walking will get them through. Um, 
We also will go through a little bit of information on screen screening for compulsive over exercise. We have a couple of different tools that you can implement on that, um, whatever works for best for your facility. Um, but making sure that you're aware of the over exercise that they're going to be entering the group, not that they have to be excluded from it, but um, just having that awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you can create a written contract or agreement mm -hmm. as needed. Um, we're looking to develop um, a book for this group, so four-week curriculum in a book form um, initiated with some sort of like agreement or commitment. So that can be like to a commitment to my body, mm -hmm. commitment to my treatment, my recovery, my team, um, you know, the people running the group, um, whatever we want that to look like, but kind of uh, starting the group with that and ending it with that as well. Mm -hmm. Which not only allows for the client to have some accountability, but also to have an agreed upon um, goal or an agreed upon uh, safety constraint between the therapist or facilitator and the group members so that we're being transparent with what we expect rather than uh, them not knowing <laughs> what it is that we are wanting in terms of safety. We also want to always include some sort of um, educational component so each part would start with that and we'll go over kind of what we've outlined as helpful um, just to kind of get them on the same page, just well this, educate them on what it is we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also a focus on positive reinforcement. So there's information in those 150 studies that indicated that unsupervised exercise can result in overexercise, right? So when you know, there is no one watching, then they're, that's when they're going to increase it. But if you're actually implementing a form of exercise, they're less likely to engage in those behaviors. Um, for example, how uh, that resident exercised through the night. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once they're actually allowed to do some, mm -hmm. you know, we find that they're, they're doing less risky behavior, less over exercise in a hidden manner. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to positively reinforce when they're doing appropriate movement. Um, that's a whole goal. Um, the next thing is that we want to just kind of gradually build their plan. So in our four week structure, we start with less movement and slowly increase. But it will look different per person and for their energy needs and what's going on outside in the rest of their treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, just a gradual increase of intensity and time frame as appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and as the whole team really sees that. And with that kind of goes like listening to their body cues and the response to exercise. We're really trying to be cautious of like this feels good, this doesn't feel good. Um, and readjusting that movement plan every week because every day we feel different. Mm -hmm. So our movements are going to look different from week to week as well. Speaking too about like recovery rates and then, you know, maybe you try some exercise that didn't feel good a day later mm -hmm. or two days later, you know, then we decrease the amount of that movement. We also want to think about the mode of exercise. So um, type, amount, um, and this is really when the LA kind of comes into play. Um, I was looking for specific research on you know, what kind of movement is indicated, and what we found was that resistance training for weight restoration was indicated for anorexia, which makes sense, and then more so of the aerobic activity um, reduces actually that drive for thinness, uh, you know, wanting to purge, mm -hmm. and body dissatisfaction in the mm -hmm. um, So that's where you would kind of cater those plans. Yeah, absolutely. And when carefully monitored, it doesn't um, need to turn into that compensatory for. Um, um, a person diagnosed with bulimia in particular, it wouldn't necessarily flip over into that exercise as compensatory behavior instead of purging um, if monitored well in treatment. So it has that potential absolutely to turn into that, and if addressed, it can actually cut down on that need for that compensatory behavior or the desire for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then my piece, of course, yeah. nutrition um, should support the movement chosen, right? So if she's choosing more of that um, aerobic activity, then they need more or less, depending on exactly what they're doing. Um, so kind of just altering the meal plan to meet the needs of what actual exercise is happening. Um, and that could be, you know, the dietitian in collaboration with support from the therapist, uh, the medical team, the rest of that. Um, and then um, what we found interesting was that something we're already doing in groups, but a deep debriefing on a checkout at the end, which looks like, you know, kind of processing what, uh, what happened in the group, how it felt afterward, mm -hmm. um, how to move forward with this plan, does it feel comfortable, um, any sensations that showed up, emotions, um, really kind of anything that went on throughout the group, they may not be used to moving in that way. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, we already talked about a lot of these ideas, but it's really important and it is indicated to use a team approach or multidisciplinary team approach. Um, one of the main reasons for that is that it is trauma informed. It is the way that trauma informed care suggests that um, clinicians go about working with clients. It uh, not only can allow for a more natural collaboration between clinicians and clients, it can also help to reduce that feeling of a power differential between clinician and clients. Um, it can offer clinicians a really uh, great way to address resistance from multiple perspectives and from multiple areas. Um, it can be a way to educate clients about resources that are available to them so that maybe it's not so scary for them to seek out the help of a nutritionist outside of treatment. Or maybe they know that they have an opportunity to seek out a um, physical therapist and that that person might be able to help them. Um, they may become more familiar with how to use a physician and a psychiatrist in a way that's helpful to them. Um, and so it just offers them more flexibility and range of resources out there. Um, it, again, does lend itself to being patient-centered, which is uh, ideally the way that we are working and is definitely trauma-informed. Um, it can also help clinicians to lessen their own bias and attachment to particular theoretical um, approaches. So it offers some flexibility in what the clients are hearing as well as what the clinicians are hearing. And so clients can get multiple perspectives on treatment at all. And clinicians can get multiple perspectives even on how that client is doing, what they're responding to, what works and what doesn't. Um, it is holistic in nature, which again, uh, we are a facility that looks at the whole client. We're looking at their biopsychosocial spiritual health and rather than just looking at the mental or just looking at the physical or just looking at the spiritual, we're trying to see the person as a whole, whole person. Um, and then it also is a, a way for um, us to avoid staff splitting, as Maggie mentioned. Um, in eating disorders in particular, uh, there is a high tendency to um, sort of villainize the nutritionist or the dietitians, and um, we will have clients sometimes come into movement groups, dance movement therapy and yoga, who will be like, they don't let me move back on lodge, and I'm angry at them, and then we talk about what's showing up, and we talk about appropriateness of when movement happens, um, we talk about why maybe they're being restricted from movement at different points in the day, we talk about what's showing up that is making them angry, maybe towards the person who is asking them to engage with food, which is really that big piece of eating disorder. So it makes sense that there's an enemy being formed there. Um, and this having a group together allows for the client to see that we work together and that this isn't about um, me having a group where they feel like they're comfortable and being with Maggie and feeling like this is the hard stuff. It's we're looking at the whole person and it's important to address both those pieces and not separate from uh, each other as if we are not part of the same treatment team. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and to speak to that a little bit, um, it's important for the dietitian because we're trying to look at mind, body, and spirit, but we're not able to fully connect in that same way that a therapist would be. Um, so, you know, we kind of look at pieces of that to a certain extent, and then, you know, the rest of some of that work is done by the therapist. Mm -hmm. So that collaboration, again, is super helpful. Um, we also, of course, want them to be safe, first and foremost, as I mentioned, being orthostatic, low bone density, so any weak score less than one, anything like whether EKG is off or compromised cardiac status. Um, or that lack of mentally. So all those things are going to be play a role in the safety of the residents, and that's what oftentimes the dietitian or the medical team would find that a therapist may not be um, aware of. Um, so some of the impact of movement on overall mental health. So this is one of the group topics that we go over, but I just wanted to lay it out um, for uh, educational purposes as well. Um, and so it kind of decreases that fight or flight hormone, so it helps to calm them in the moment, um, increases uh, the serotonin, so that positivity, which helps, of course, regulate their mood. Um, you know, that that actually makes people feel better um, in the endorphins as well. You know that? Mm -hmm. um, increasing that tolerance for a rapid heart rate. So, again, like my resident who had the asthma and felt uncomfortable walking, you know, slowly increased tolerance and felt. Um, more more able by the time that she left here. Um, we found studies that indicated that the synchronizing of movement, so moving with others mm -hmm. in the group form, mm -hmm. can really impact their self-esteem and allow them to feel more comfortable, maybe not moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, 
and the, of course, the meditative movement, so the yoga and things we can help you know, mindfulness and so much of the work that we do here. Yeah, slowing down. Um, and just to connect that idea of the slower mindful movement back to the decreasing of the reactivity of fight or flight, mm -hmm. we had a particular client with a trauma history. Um, she's actually a veteran and uh, had a history of flashbacks and a history of um, really, really low self-worth and attaching self-worth to how many reps of physical activity she could do. She was a mixed martial arts fighter um, and she used to box and then sustained an injury um, and ended up um, feeling really uncomfortable in her body without having that outlet. And so we found that by um, slowing down a little bit and finding a way in through Tai Chi, which feels a little bit close to the martial arts that she was familiar with, we were able to get her back into the present moment when she was feeling like jumping out into dissociation or into her flashbacks, because movement happens in the present moment. And Tai Chi in particular takes a really intentional focus and breath work. And so we're we're moving in the present moment, which helps a person who likes to dissociate or likes to kind of step out of that present moment to come back and stay here. And then we're meeting that um, uh, that intolerable internal feeling with some kind of tolerable movement that connects to something familiar. So for her, it was something akin to martial arts. Absolutely. Um, and in addition to that, we found that the um, brain deprived neurotrophic factor, which increases the um, nerve fibers and also long-term memory is naturally increased with movement. Um, so something more of a long-term result, but really helpful nonetheless. And then there were also some studies, again, as I've mentioned, we're on a campus um, that has a lot of space outdoors. So a simple walk, mm -hmm. um, as we all increases vitamin D, which helps fight disease and osteoporosis. Again, we have the bone density issue with a lot of our anorexia or malnourished residents. Um, and we've also implemented a garden at St. Um, mm -hmm. and that's been a really cool part of nutrition groups mm -hmm. um, and just expressing movement in a different way um, and not a typical exercise that you would think right. of, but yeah. if you're just going for a walk or gardening, mm -hmm. um, can certainly be considered a mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is really important for us to think about appropriate movement. We talked a little bit to this already. Um, so we're looking at movement that helps to increase flexibility in the way that we think about physical activity. So we're trying to introduce a range of movements and, um, and physical activities so that residents have that ability to see that there is so much uh, available to them. Um, we're looking at purposes for movement that aren't just about compens compensation for um, eating, that we're not looking at exercise as a way to lose weight. We're looking at movement as a natural state of the human body. We're looking at movement as a way for regulating mood, movement as a way to um, help to feel strong and a, a sense of self, even feel some pride. Um, we're looking at both functional and expressive movement. Um, so gardening might be a functional kind of movement that can also have some expressivity in there when we're arriving at the garden that you've created. Um, we're also looking at the um, movement as a form of body connection and connection to the internal self. And so not just what does it look like on the outside? What am I doing on the outside? But what is it feeling like on the inside? Um, we're addressing the need for uh, increased nutritional exchanges potentially or an increased uh, intake of water. We're looking at what, what can we do nutritionally to support movement. Um, and then, of course, we're doing this group in a safe space with a small group of people. Um, we are having two at least facilitators in the room, so we have multiple eyes on the residents. Um, and we are uh, using the same kind of rules and expectations we have in any other group about keeping uh, respect for self and other, making sure that we're coming in with a practice of non-judgment for self and other, knowing that it's really vulnerable work. Um, and then we're looking at 10 to 60 minutes, three to five times a week. Um, that's something we can do here at Timberline Mills, starting more towards the 10 minute to start with, looking at 10 minutes being a perfectly fine amount of movement in a day. Um, and we have a lot of range in 10 to 60 minutes, so we can start to build up over time as well. Okay, so we're going to move into the practical application for the nitty gritty of how we can incorporate this. Absolutely. So knowing that we are running a little low on time, this may feel like a quick movement through, but that's all right. We'll try to cover it all. Um, so the basic group outline here is we start with a check-in. We have an introduction to the topic of the week. Uh, we have an experiential for the clients to engage in. We come to the development of an individual movement plan, and then we check out after that. 
So we'll go through all four weeks with you and just talk through the topics, um, a basic intervention that we might use, um, and some of the points of that psychoeducation as well. And this is a piece of our assessment here, is gauging that current relationship with exercise. So we could do this to start off the group, or we could do it prior to them entering the group, depending on where we feel like they're at. And so we'll just walk you through a couple of different tools that you can use. Mm -hmm. um, so this is one that I've used in sessions before. Um, so there's a couple different ways you can use it. Um, you can use it to screen someone. So the list um, time clock uh, indicating where you're spending time thinking about exercise, where you're actually exercising, where you're sleeping, where you're doing other things throughout your day. Um, and you can also use it upon leaving or discharging to see how it's changed, hopefully, um, or what our goals are, are for moving forward. This one's really helpful. Um, this is one question here developed by TK, just about intention of movement, um, what's going on for you before or during and after, um, negative thoughts during the workout, and um, what coping skills can you utilize? And this could be elaborated on the part. Yeah. And these show up on our individual movement plan as well, which I'll describe to you in a moment. And so here's just a portion of the obligatory exercise questionnaire. There's a couple of different ones. This is the one that we used. Um, just looks at kind of rating your uh, thoughts on applications mm -hmm. towards movement, what kind of movement. Um, again, this is just a short portion of it. Um, So these are just speaking to the goals, the general goals that we have for this group. Um, so we're practice, we're involving practice. That's a big part of this experiential practice and processing our physical activity um, with supervision from our clinicians. We're trying to increase that flexibility, break down some of that rigidity around what physical activity means and looks like. Um, introducing nutritional requirements and flexibility around those with physical activity. And then we're also inviting residents to practice integrating multiple aspects of their treatment. Yeah, so again, we're going to go week by week. I want to give a shout out to Alison Dean mm -hmm. Senso, the dietitian that worked on week one and two, and I focused my efforts on weeks two, uh, three and four. Mm -hmm. However, the first week is uh, about balance. So for the dietitian, that means about exchanges and fluids. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do our psychoeducation on what that looks like on a normal day, what that looks like when you increase exercise, um, and what that looks like when there's too much exercise and that, you know, we can't keep up with the nutrition. Yes. And so our general rule of thumb recommendation is that any uh, for a half hour to an hour of exercise, you want to do at least a cup of water um, and any excessive exercise, so uh, rapid heart rate, sweating, uh, or any sort of out of breath you want to add um, typically two exchanges uh, for an hour. Mm -hmm. And that may look like a carbon protein. Um, we've discussed individual basis what that could be, but typically two exchanges for an hour. Mm -hmm. And so from a movement perspective, that's looking like trying to balance between exertion and recuperation. So we'll introduce the idea of exertion recuperation cycles to the clients, um, looking at what are we uh, doing in terms of activity and how are we resting. We're looking at uh, balancing strengthening with stretching. We're looking at balancing our upper and lower body. So we're not just working out one part. Um, we're looking at using breath support and truly balancing that out as well. Um, and we are also looking at balancing our right and left sides so that we're not just focusing on a single part or single exercise. Um, and so this, uh, and an intervention might look like a set of physical activities that may look like squats or may look like holding a plank or might look like some lunges, followed by something that looks like stretching of those muscle groups or looking like we're taking time to rest in something like Shavasana, the final resting pose of yoga, where we are lying down and observing body signals. Um, it could also look like something where it's a high intensity movement for about five minutes, followed by a lower intensity. So that might even look like a fast paced walking followed by a really mindful slow walking. So we're looking at balancing between different kinds of physical activity in this first week. And so for the dietitian perspective on internal awareness, we're going to talk a lot about hunger and fullness cues. So before exercise, during exercise, after exercise, um, and looking at the rest and recuperation as well and how that feels in their body and recommending you know, no less than two days of rest. Um, and also, you know, we'll look at how they feel when they eat an hour before movement. How do they feel when they eat 30 minutes before movement? How do they feel when they eat three hours before? And then kind of how their body responds to that. Yeah, absolutely. And from the movement perspective, here we're looking at um, learning to understand our body cues. 
uh, knowing what it feels like when we're over or under exerting, um, maybe noticing what our heart rate and how to check it, what it feels like, how to check it, noticing what happens to our breath, how sustainable our breath is. Um, we don't use mirrors here at Tim Miller Mills in any of our movement rooms, and so that is encouraging a focus on the internal self as well. Um, we are also looking at uh, checking back to see what felt good or not so good about the movement plan that was developed in the first week. So we're checking in with muscle soreness, maybe overuse or some fatigue in there, looking at maybe there wasn't enough time in a rest portion. So uh, yeah, we are starting to um, educate the clients on what those internal signals might look like and then asking them to identify their personal signals because of course they're different for every person. And for week three, we speak to the movement and mood. So a slide that I already went over, which outlines um, the benefits of movement um, and mood, but also kind of reflecting on how they feel about it and what um, messages they've been told about it in the past. Um, I also like to speak to like inadequate intake and mood. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel when you're not nourished enough and you exercise? Um, I talk a lot about like ketosis. That seems to be a hot topic, right? So like the breakdown of that or of muscle and fat of fat and you know when we're not malnourished it's actually hurting our bodies or when we are malnourished we're hurting our bodies and not providing enough energy to get through the movement mm -hmm. and also talking about how well you know if we have athletes how well do you perform when you're nourished versus when you're not right yeah and then um, in movement we're looking at uh, which kinds of emotions are a struggle to hold which ones are a struggle to tolerate and identifying where those live in the body um, looking at maybe ways that those feelings could be increased through movement or intensified through movement in ways that they can be shifted or decreased in intensity through movement. So that might look like um, for someone whose anxiety shows up as like shaking in tension, it might look at how do we know if we're increasing this tension, maybe we shake a little bit more, maybe we get even more tense, or if we're looking at trying to decrease or shift the intensity, maybe we're noticing the first place that can relax a little bit, the next place that can maybe let go a little bit. But trying to invite them to really identify what impacts their mood through movement, what kind of movement has what kind of impact on their inner selves. I also included this picture um, of dog therapy, of pet therapy on here. Um, again, kind of a functional movement petting a dog, though it can be expressive as well. It's a kind of movement that we don't always think about, but there is some research showing that petting a dog, engaging in movement of um, animal-assisted therapy can boost mood. And so looking for ways to engage in movement that feel really good, that invite that boost of endorphins or dopamine, um, that make us feel like we want to engage in life. And so movement with dogs is one way to do that as well that we practice here at Tim Yeah, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And also equine care. Yes, 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 yes. Not, for sure. Um, could be included in mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. um, So the last one is movement values and beliefs. So this is where we do a lot of dispelling. Um, so we've had the idea of bringing in um, magazines with information on you know, diets, um, exercise regimens, recommendations. I saw a magazine that I brought in that said um, in one week lose, lose 27 pounds, <laughs> right? So like with, in the absence of like cutting a limb off, I'm not sure how you would do that. So like talking through that. Um, and so really just lots of education and selling um, and asking the questions about where they're finding that information. So yeah. who's stating the claim, you know, what benefit is it to who's stating the claim um, and why are they recommending that you do it and for how long. So really kind of uh, looking at that information with a crucial eye. Absolutely. And some of the movement myths that we're looking to dispel is the idea of no pain, no gain. And often that pain is a sign of a potential injury or overuse injury. Um, we're looking at the fact that if you don't use muscle, it's going to turn into fat. That's not true. They, they don't convert into each other. Um, we're looking at uh, more exercise is better, not necessarily. In fact, we may be more prone to injury the more exercise we engage in, um, especially without adequate support of nutrition in that. Um, we're also looking at um, that exercise might feel like it takes too much time and that 10 minutes is a very appropriate amount of exercise or physical activity in the day. Um, and then also we're going to take a look through movement and the experiential portion um, at some of those less, uh, less well thought of as physical activity activities. So maybe we're doing mindful walking or we are focusing on more of a restorative yoga practice that day. Maybe we're looking at functional movement in our lives and how we can incorporate more of that too and how we feel about it as well.
So this just goes over that we want to continually reassess if the movement is inappropriate. Do they need to no longer participate in the group related to non-compliance or weight loss? Mm -hmm. So we're just going to continually keep that going. Um, and really movement after um, residential level of care, we want to set up that movement plan for home um, and reach out to active coaches, families, mm -hmm. contacts, and then for support and education as needed. Um, and really just set them up for success. Yes. This would be a sample of a movement plan that um, Natalie may go over with residents. Um, we each kind of have a piece of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And overall, um, again, we would recommend this in our residential or an inpatient level of care, but it could be um, altered to meet to needs at an outpatient level or a lower level. Um, and movement recommendations would be anywhere from 10 to 60 minutes, three to five times a week, which as you realize is a very big um, <laughs> range. And we would uh, tailor that to the residents needs depending on the treatment team. And psychoeducation in this spelling is going to be really crucial um, in the long term care um, of these movement plans. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it just, we want to check back in with the resident uh, or any clients that we're doing these movement plans with to see how it's working for them and really trying to listen to their needs, their preferences, um, and where they're activating and triggering um, and relapse risks might actually look to. So thanks, folks. Yes, yeah, thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs> All right, thank you, Maggie and Natalie, so, so much. It was great to have you. And um, I just have one question that popped up from yeah. one of our um, one of our attendees during your presentation. It's from Geneva, and she asked, um, do you consider yoga movement to be aerobic? Um, mm -hmm. And I think she, when you guys were talking about aerobic exercise, um, I think that's what this refers to. She says, what type of aerobic exercise? Absolutely. Um, so some forms of yoga can definitely be considered aerobic and some forms not so much. Um, if the heart rate is getting up, sometimes if you're in a vinyasa flow class where there's breath and movement paired together, that'll feel like more of an aerobic activity. Um, power yoga for sure feels like an aerobic activity. Um, and Bikram as well can feel like an aerobic activity, though uh, it can, you can actually use yoga to do both things. So you can have that aerobic and then maybe participate in a restorative yoga class to receive that um, less aerobic, more of that stretching and strengthening as well. And I think it depends on the yoga class you go to and also your own um, cardiovascular experience and so and how much um, how much activity you're doing already. And so it impacts the body differently depending on how much experience or how much cardio you've got in your routine at the moment too. Yeah. I hope that answers to me this question. I'm not 100% sure though. Yeah, yeah, she said thank you. So that's yeah. perfect. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Maggie and Natalie, thank you so much. This is a wonderful presentation. Um, and I just wanna let all of our attendees know, um, we did get a couple questions about the CEs. So I am, um, going to right now in the chat feature that's associated with Zoom here. You can click on chat. Um, and I just sent everyone a link um, to a survey, a Google survey that you will have to complete and submit. Uh, obviously you can do that now or you can do that um, after the entire day of presentations is over, up to you. But that needs to be completed and submitted to us so that we can get your CE submitted. So, um, all right. Thank you both so much. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.